So all of you have seen the introductory DVDs? Yes. yes. Awesome. What did you think? Well... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's pretty embarrassing having to say some things that most people feel <laughs> some kind of response to afterwards. And the reason why I've come here today is to answer any of your questions, actually. So it gives, it gives you an opportunity to just speak up and, and uh, answer, ask any questions that you <coughs> have about that introductory stuff, introductory material that you've seen. And, uh, but before I start, I'll just give you a little bit of a background of myself. Um, AJ stands for Alan John, so it's just shortened to AJ. Uh, Miller, my last name is. I was born in Bloxton in South Australia. And, uh, 45 years ago, and uh, I've got two sons, uh, one's 24, one's 22, and I live up in the bush in Queensland, uh, about three hours away from Peter. And I met Peter um, when I was still living in South Australia. Um, well, it, I met Peter living in Queensland, but the whole thing started by my trips from South Australia up to Queensland, meeting a friend of Peter's that had been on one of his Alpha courses. And, uh, and then uh, Peter wanted to meet me as well, so I, I drove down to meet Peter nine months ago or so. And since then, Peter's really felt an affinity to the, to the information that I've been presenting to groups there. And so he's been linking up all the people that he's been involved with teaching, yourselves included, um, and, and just uh, giving them the opportunity to hear the same information as well. Now, um, most of the times when we're put in the spot to ask questions, most of the times we, uh, our mind just goes blank and we forget what we're going to ask. <clears throat> I was wondering whether any of you have straight away some questions that you'd like to ask, or I can start just by going over the introduction that I, that I gave you on the DVDs, and then that might prompt questions as you go. So we might do that if none of you are, are, are ready for questions. You've got one? So, yes, um, your description of God. Yes. Mine is yes, <coughs> everything and everywhere, but not me. But you didn't give us all of a description. Mm -hmm. you know, he's just all encompassing. Everything, but yeah, not. <coughs> you didn't give a description. You give a description. Can I give a description of yes. God? And there are a lot of New Age philosophies, hey, that talk about uh, God being everywhere and in everything automatically. Um, there's also a lot of. Uh, religious concepts of God um, that are obviously also sometimes quite damaging in, in their belief structure. So one of the things that you'll do on the Divine Love Path is you'll, you'll only be able to get to know God as you receive God's love into your soul. So although I can make comments about God's qualities and attributes, which I can do now, bear in mind that you're not going to feel those qualities and attributes until you actually feel God. To, to God's love enters you. But God is an entity, not an energy, not just an energy. So you know how a lot of people say that God is the, uh, is the energy of the universe or the entire universe is God. And my viewpoint is that the universe was created by God, not God itself. So the universe is an attribute or a quality of God, but doesn't make it God. Just like love is a quality of God, but God is not just love. But God is much more than just love, in fact. So, so God has all these attributes and qualities that are a part of what I would classify as her great oversoul. She is the great oversoul of the universe. She created all the laws that create all of the potentials in the universe itself. And so she has the power to desire something, and at the instant she desires, it comes into existence. So God is uh, also personal God. Once you enter a personal relationship with God, you start realising that God is your mother or your father. And you can actually enter this personal relationship with God. Now, if God was just an energy, how do you enter a personal relationship with an energy? It's a bit more difficult, isn't it? It's a bit like saying, you know, that uh, oh, I've got a personal relationship with the electricity <coughs> here, because that's an energy, right? You can't really have a person to person relationship, can you, with just an energy form. Now God does have energy, just like you have energy. In your Alpha courses, you, you rec started recognising some of the energies of your own body, some of the energies of your own soul, 
and you started to tune in even, remember when you did the scanning exercises and so forth, you started to tune into the energies of other people and you could see where their energies were blocked in their body and what was actually going on inside of their body. So the truth is that you have energy, but energy is not you. Energy is just an attribute or a quality that you have that you can actually utilise to examine and experience the universe. The same is true for God. God has energy, and one of her energies is love, but she also has other energies as well. She has a creative energy. She also has an energy of life. <coughs> So there'll be times in your future where you will actually create or manifest an, an animal, but it won't have life until God's energy, God's life-giving energy, enters that animal, and then you'll be able to create that animal and it become to life. When does that happen? Uh, when you're at one with God, you can do these things. So, so when all of you get to that stage, you'll be starting to do these things and seeing these things happening here on Earth. At the moment, they're all happening in the spirit world, in different locations, but not happening here on Earth because no one's ever been in the condition to actually do it. Is it likely that someone's going to be in that condition? Yes. See? Yes. Yeah. And it's fairly likely that you might be. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not as hard as what people have a tendency to believe. And it doesn't take, you know how there's this new age belief that it takes lifetime upon lifetime to become a refined being or an enlightened being, that's not true at all. It only needs to take, in fact, a few years for you to work through some very sincere emotions before you can be into that state once you receive divine love into the soul. So remember in the introductory thing I said, here, here's God with masculine and feminine qualities. Here's your soul. And God and you can have a connection. And when God and you have a connection, and this divine love, so the divine love that comes from God, and I call it divine love because it's God's love, it's not your love. It's different quality and different attributes to your love. And the divine love enters your soul. What it does is it transforms your soul. It changes your soul from a human soul into, once you're at one with God, into a divine soul, or you could call it an angel, is sometimes the terms you hear from the New Age movement. And what happens is as God's divine love enters your soul, it transforms your soul, it changes who you are. What does it look like for someone who's watching that happen? Uh, if it's a spirit watching it happen, what they see is a beam of light from an unknown source that they can't identify, entering the person. And, and what happens in the spirit form is that as the person's receiving divine love, the spirit form just light up, lights up like a turning on a light. And while you're receiving divine love, the spirit form lights up like that. And then when you've finished receiving divine love, and when I say finished, because you're not, if you're not yet at one with God, you sort of, the divine love ebbs and flows into you, depending upon what resistance you have inside of your own soul, right? So as the divine love enters your soul, it's like your whole being lights up. And as your whole being lights up, every spirit around can actually see that you're actually receiving divine love at that moment. It's just here on earth that's not easily seen, except if we have our third eye chakra developed enough to be able to see things like that. So as God's divine love enters your soul, it just expands your soul's capacity to experience emotion. Because divine love is one of God's emotions. So what's actually happening is one of God's emotions is entering you. Now, if you're not willing to feel your own emotions, how can somebody else's emotion into you? It can't really, can it? Can you see that? If you're blocking off your own emotions, then God's emotion is not going to be able to enter you. So, my suggestion is to start doing some things about the divine love and receiving divine love into, into your soul. And I'll talk about some things about that later about three particular things that you'll need to do to, to actually make that happen. And we'll explain those things. It's very simple to understand. A child can understand it. Does that help also locate emotions that you need to heal? When Always, you're doing yes. that, just by doing that? Yes. Okay, yeah. we we'll better get on to it then. <laughs> yeah. well, and it is the most simplest way, in fact, to locate emotions within yourself that you need to heal. Okay. When I say simple, please don't misinterpret that as easy. Right. Simple and easy are not the same things, are they? 
Simple is simple to understand, simple to graph, simple to actually to interpret. Easy, it's going to be quite difficult at times for you because of the emotions you hold within you that you believe to be true. And so therefore it's going to be quite difficult to actually allow those emotions to flow through you. So if you think about last week, for example, how many times did you get angry last week? Did everyone get angry last week? Put your hand up. If you didn't get angry last week, <laughs> yeah, so pretty much everyone got angry last week at some point, or frustrated, or, or annoyed, or whatever. Right. Now, anger is a capping emotion. In other words, anger is an emotion that covers over these huge other emotions inside of you that you don't want to feel. And so what happens is when we don't want to feel them, because those emotions feel powerless to feel, what we do is we want to have a powerful feeling within ourselves, so we create this anger within ourselves to actually overcome these terrible emotions that we need to feel inside of ourselves. So every time I'm angry, I'm doing that. Every single time. So if you think about last week, and just ponder about how many times you were angry last week, you start realising that every single time you were angry last week, you were covering over an emotion inside of yourself. Now, that's a bit of a scary proposition, really, in itself, isn't it? What emotions are you covering over when you get angry? And how many of you wanted to blame someone else when you were getting angry? <laughs> isn't that why you got angry? Like, mm -hmm. oh, they did that for me, or that person did that. But in reality, something was inside of yourself that you were covering over right at that moment. So, so yes. So, if, if in that moment when you're feeling anger, you decide to make a conscious decision, I actually want to locate what is causing this anger, how do you do that? Well, it's not about your mind, for a start. <laughs> okay. right? the, the fact that you're already in anger means that you've already made a conscious choice to not feel what's underneath. Okay. okay. Do, you, do you understand that? Yeah. Mm. The reason for your anger, in fact, is because there's already a decision that's already been made to deny what's underneath. And so the first thing I really need to say is, I'm really angry. I need to acknowledge the truth. What was the situation that caused the anger? I need to acknowledge that this situation creates anger in me. And I also need to acknowledge that when I'm angry, I'm actually covering over the real emotion that I need to feel and release inside of myself, right at that moment. But I'm not going to be able to make a conscious choice to do that, okay. because the anger is already a soul-based choice, a feeling-based choice to not feel that emotion. You follow me? Yes. So every time I'm in a state of anger, I've already made a choice to get away from the underlying emotion. Right at that moment, I've already made the choice. And I need to acknowledge that, that this was my choice. My anger is my choice. So a soul-based choice is always in charge rather than a head-based totally. choice. And that's the main thing to understand, that this is the real you. So what's the real you? It's your passions. So I'll just write some of these things down. Your desires your intentions, your emotions, and inspiration, aspiration, free will, memories, all of that, all of that is the real you. That is not your body. So here, next to that is your body, your spirit body, and your material body. You've got two bodies. When mum and dad had sex and conceived you, they conceived two bodies. They conceived a spirit body and a material body, and your soul was attracted to those <coughs> bodies and connected to them. And it connected to them because it needs these bodies to experience itself. It needs the bodies to experience its own self while it's a half of a soul. Remember this is a half of a soul. You are a half of a soul, right? You're not a complete soul, half of a soul. AJ, you say that when the soul separates, mm -hmm. right, your half a soul, that half a soul is attracted to the parents. Is that right? By the parents' law of attraction, right. yep. Right, uh, when the soul separates, you said it's got no memory? It's got no memory, no idea no. Yep. of itself. So when the parent attracts the soul, mm -hmm. then all those memories, emotions and everything that that half soul carries belong to the parent. Um, Come from the parent. The half soul doesn't carry any of these things until it actually connects to these, the, to their bodies. But that is only when the parents 
choose the soul. Uh, when you say the parents choose, again, it's not an intellectual <coughs> thing. It's an emotional thing that's going on between in the two parents. Yeah. And, it, there is, and it's connecting to a certain personality of a soul that's yet to incarnate. Because the parents need a certain type of person to trigger their own emotions. <coughs> but you're saying the half soul hasn't got a personality until it is created. No, I've never said that. Until it's incarnated. No, I've never said that. The soul, half soul has a personality, but it doesn't have an idea or consciousness of itself. It doesn't know it exists. But all of it comes from, you know, from being created or incarnated to the parents. No. God creates the personality. Of, the, of, the, of each of you, your personalities have been created by God. So you have a personality, but when you're in that pristine state before you incarnate, you are not conscious of your own existence. You do not know you exist, and therefore you do not know you've got free will. You do not know anything about yourself. And it's the process of incarnation that begins your knowledge of yourself. It begins your process of self-discovery. Right? It's the process of incarnation that does that. But as soon as you incarnate, your parents' emotions start filtering into your soul. Because your parents' emotions are part of the environment that you're in. So right now, all of you are absorbing each other's emotions. Do you understand that? Right now, whether you're conscious of it or not, you're absorbing each other's emotions. Are we getting some of yours? Uh, yes, and also there's, there's lot, lots and lots of spirits here as well, and you're absorbing their emotions as well. Do they stay once we leave? Like, do the emotions that we're feeling right this minute, is that our choice? Is that a choice thing? Yeah, it's always a choice thing, even though we may not be conscious of yeah. it. It's still a choice that's happening at the soul level to absorb these emotions. Okay. Yep. When, uh, when you absorb your parents' emotions, if your parents have, don't sort those emotions out, are you able to? Um, you're able to later in your life, but often as a child you're not able to. Because you, as a child you haven't got that cognizance yet within your soul to work out to actually how to fully experience the emotion. Most children fully experience the emotion, even if it is emotion coming from a parent of damage. They'll fully experience it, but usually the parents start <coughs> shutting them down as well, because the parents shut themselves down. Yeah. So, so a lot of times a little baby might start crying, and what does the parent do? Picks up the little child and shh, shh, everything will be alright, right? And what we're doing right at that moment is we are projecting onto the child a shut down emotion. And the child is actually now getting, well hang on a sec, it's not right for me anymore to cry. My parent seems to get distressed every time I cry. You follow me? Yeah. And so, so straight away the child is getting taught how to shut down its emotions. <coughs> Children are a perfect reflection of parents' emotions if you allow them to fully experience the emotion. So if, if, I, if my parents pass on something to me, and now at this stage I can, I can clean it out or, or totally. fix it up, does that fix it up for them as well? No. No. And <laughs> if I pass that on to my child, does, if I fix it up, <coughs> does it fix it up for her? Yes. Or does she have to build it? No. Why it does. It? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but not fully. It depends on their age and what decisions yeah. they've made because of it. But one okay. thing we all must realise as parents, that if you choose to to get rid of your own emotions while you've got children, young children, you'll find that as you deal with each emotion, the child will no longer experience that emotion and it will automatically release its emotion as well yeah. as a result. That happens automatically. But it doesn't happen in the reverse automatically. So if the, if the child releases the emotion and the parent, the parent doesn't automatically release the emotion. So you can help your children by helping yourself, but you can't help your parents. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> and when you, think, when you think about it, that makes a lot of a uh, lot of sense from a law of karma point of view. Yeah. From a law of conversation point of view, in that in the parents holding on to their own emotion is what created the emotion in you. So as a parent, if you want to solve any issues with regard to what's going on with the children, the best thing for you to do is deal with your own emotion. Yeah. You do that and automatically your children will continually respond. There's a discussion coming up that I'm going to do in Brisbane that's about parenting children. And it'll be a five hour discussion about, about how all of that works. By a child, what age have we got to parent? Are you doing that? Are you Sorry, what was that question? She, she asked by what age, like if, if I start clearing my emotions, does it affect my children at oh, what age? Okay. So whether it, that's, that's is it only when they're young or is it when they're older yeah. or whatever? And the, the answer is, if a parent clears away its emotion, it affects the child at any age. With, 
one proviso. If the child is at an age where they are now making choices and decisions that have affected other people about these emotions, then that child will still need to work through those particular issues. So, so obviously the younger the child, the easier it's going to be. But if our child, say, in our teenage years, we can certainly do things with, for them in the teenage years, but by the time they get to a stage where they're determining their own life, they're exercising their own free will to make their choices and decisions, by that stage it's more difficult to affect them from clearing away their own emotions. But I've uh, had people who are like uh, in their 60s who have 40-year-old children and they've worked through an emotion towards their child and all of a sudden their child has treated them differently. Right? So, so it happens at any age, but obviously the older we get, the more difficult it becomes for the child to actually start choosing itself. It needs to choose for itself. And I, um, I didn't fully accept who I was until I was, uh, I was, I was 40, so five years ago. Uh, I, the first people I told were my two boys. And, and they, ironically, accepted it straight away. Um, which surprised me a lot, uh, because everyone else didn't. <laughs> but, uh, but they accepted it straight away. My, my eldest son uh, straight away also accepted the divine path as well. And he's he's been he's been progressing on the path. My younger son has already has also accepted it, but he's a bit more resistive to it at the moment because he wants to have a good like a good life as well, rather than just delving into his emotions and clearing them out rapidly. But he is actually doing the emotional work as well. So one of my sons lives with me in Kenroy, and not that he, we live uh, very close together because we're on a 40-acre property, but the other son lives in Tasmania. So that, yeah, they accepted it quite well. My parents didn't, though. My mother tried to have me committed, so. <laughs> Back to the recreation. If God's a loving God, okay, and he creates a soul that's been affected by parents, and over the eons of time the creation's gone on, and the, the level of soul it's the density that the souls have created into. How can God allow that to happen? When we keep passing on our, our rubbish to our children and our grandchildren and yep. so on and so forth. So how does God allow that to happen if he's yeah. a loving God? Why hasn't he stopped it or given us some more information sooner? Right. Um, <coughs> firstly, the question that you're asked comes from an emotion within you. Where, and, and by the way, many of you have this emotion. <coughs> where you do not trust God. Right? And you don't trust God because you see all of these things happening around you that you see as evil or bad. And then you wonder how God can relate, can actually allow these things to occur. How he could have created his laws in such a manner that allow these things to occur. Now that emotion in itself drives a lot of questions in our own mind. Do you follow me? So firstly, recognise that it's an emotion that's driven the question. And it's a good question. Right. So here's God. What God did was created something, and that is he created the potential. If I can spell potential right. So the first thing God did was God set up all of these laws of the universe. And the laws of the universe existed before the universe existed. Right? You could say the laws of the universe are like a skeleton in which the universe has to live. Now, the laws of the universe are created in such a way that God created the potential for everything. So God created the potential for evil as well as the potential for good. And the way, the way God did that was God created this thing, this beautiful gift actually that you have called, called free will. Now, at the moment, we often use our free will in total disharmony to God's laws. Right? And oftentimes, we often don't see our free will being exercised and the effects that it actually has on everybody around us. 
Uh, yesterday I asked the audience um, how many of the ladies had a diamond ring on their finger? How many of you ladies have got a diamond ring on your finger? Okay, so quite a number. Do you realise how many people died to put this diamond ring on your finger? Yes, it's a horrible movie. Yeah. yeah. Can you see that just your choice to have a diamond ring on your finger created the death of somebody? Now that's a pretty confronting statement, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Lucky we ne n people never die. It's <laughs> <laughs> so lucky that they actually continue to live on right. in the spirit world. <laughs> but can you see that just that one choice that seems innocent to us actually has so much power that it actually finishes up killing people on the other side of the world where these diamonds come from. Right? Now can you see how how we can't say God allowed something when we use our free will to make a choice that created some badness. You follow me? Can't God see that that free will that he gave humans in creation is destroying the planet? It's destroying... No, it's not the free will. The free will is not destroying the planet. It's the person's choice to use the free will in disharmony with love that destroys the planet. You see, it's like, it's like I create a knife, right? I make a great big knife and I cut up my veggies with it. That's a pretty good use for a knife, isn't it? But I could also slit your throat with it. But now, who made the choice to slit your throat? Did the knife make the choice? Isn't the knife a handy tool? Just like this free will is like a beautiful gift. The knife is a gift. If you want to start cutting up, cutting up some veggies, isn't the knife the best tool to do it? And yet, we can use that tool to completely damage somebody to the point where we've killed them. Can you see how the giving somebody a gift doesn't mean the responsibility rests with the gift giver? It re the responsibility rests with the person who uses this gift in the way that they've chosen to use it. Does that make sense? Before the soul separates then, do we get a choice not to separate? <laughs> no, you can't. Well, <laughs> at that moment you don't have choice, no. Well, therefore, that's, you know, I don't have free will, do I? If I chose not to separate, then my parents couldn't have passed on their, their stuff to me. But if your parents chose to clear away all their emotions, you would have no emotions to deal with. Yeah, but they haven't. And what parents have? No one has. But all of us have the choice to do it. We yes, can do it. But you're saying there's only a few of us that have gone and you know, have evolved back far enough to recreate again. So no parents have really... So what's your emotion? I'm angry. I am angry. I'm angry to think that I was created and I've done my best to do it right. Yeah. And my problem, especially with drinking in my family, mm -hmm. has been passed on to my grandchildren yeah. and my children yeah. from my mother and father. I yeah. don't drink. Yeah. But you know that, the, that that emotion that creates drinking has obviously been passed down to the subsequent generations. Yeah. And you've done your best to prevent that, and now you're feeling really angry with God. You want to be angry with someone. Well, and so I'm angry at the, the way creation works. Is yeah, but it, but it, but while you hold on to this anger, you're denying a deeper emotion. Do you know what that deeper emotion is? No. Does anybody have an idea what it might be? Rejection. Rejection. Resentment. Well, resentment is really anger that sees. There's a deeper emotion. Worthiness. Sorry? Not feeling worthy? Well, there's, there's firstly, let's look at it in terms of a pleasure and pain. Is the underlying emotion going to be pleasurable or painful? Painful. Okay. So it's going to be painful. And what kind of things might need to happen with this underlying emotion rather than staying in anger? See, the problem is that we can stay in anger as long as we want because we have free will. God gives you the choice. You can stay in your anger and your blame as long as you want. Right? And that, for many people, they pass into the spirit world and they stay in their anger for another hundred years or two hundred years or three hundred years until they exhaust their anger. You don't have to do that. You can actually <coughs> decide right now to, to stop staying in this anger and get into the pain. Because what it is, is we're not wanting to feel the pain. That's why we get angry. Uh, sorry. How about a schizophrenia? Um, can I deal with mental illness type things a little bit in the future? Yep, that'd be good. Do you know how 
how you said everyone has free will. Well, what about the people in communist China? Yep. Like, they don't really have it, so how does that work? And free will isn't dependent upon what other people make you do. Free will is a, is a condition inside of yourself. So, for instance, if a person came up to me and put a gun in my hand and said, you've got to shoot that person, right? I would just refuse and refuse until they kill me. Now, to me, that's my exercise of free will. Now, to you, it may seem like I'm being forced to do something wrong. But to me, that, that's not ha happening at all. I'm not being forced into doing anything. I don't have to do whatever anybody is telling me to do. So every single person in communist China doesn't have to do what their government tells them to do. They are just in so much fear that they all continue to do it. Uh, and this is where fear often is what causes us to use our free will or to dampen our free will to such a point that we no longer feel we can make choices. The truth is that fear doesn't need to dominate your life. So that's very important to understand. If these people have been censored since they were young, so they have no idea, so they still, still have a choice. Every single one of them, if they tuned into their soul, so you know when you say we're in the Alpha course, what caused you to go to the course? <coughs> like, there, there's literally 50, like, for how many people were sent out flyers? 50,000 people? Down here, about uh, 35,000. 35,000 people were sent flyers. And how many people turned up to the course? 100. 100. Right? Now, who had the choice to come to the... Who were given the choice? 35,000 people were given the choice. Right? And this is what happening, is happening all over the world. Is thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people are being given choices every single moment. But because we're willing to stay in our fear, we don't make the choice. Every one of you could have chosen to stay in your fear, your fear of spending, what is it, like 800 bucks or whatever to go to a course, your fear of, you know, what other people are going to think about you when you do it, your fear of all sorts of things might have dictated a totally different thing to you and you might not have ever gone to the course, right? But how did the course affect you? Did it change you? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so you made a choice and you decided at some point to stop making choices based on your fears and to start making different choices. Now, what caused you to do that? Your free will, wasn't it? There was something inside of you that caused you to seek more truth in your life, isn't there? That's why you did that. And every single person <coughs> on the planet has the opportunity to do that. All right. Now, because of the oppression and all of the other things that have happened, and I'll talk about some of them, that have happened over the thousands of years before our time, most people in the earth feel they can't do it because they're in a state of fear. And one thing is that the world needs people who are going to be leaders in no longer disseminating fear, but rather in giving love. And that's why in the end of the Alpha Course, you were encouraged to start giving love to others, weren't you? Mm -hmm. right? And the reason why is because the world needs people who are willing to do that, who are willing to overcome their fears and to get into that space of love and to do those things. This is just a comment for um, kind of for both of you, but the Alpha Course actually was the, what I think strengthened my free will enough to come here. I really don't think I would have came and saw you yeah, yeah. if I hadn't have gotten what I got out of the Alpha course? Yes, and, and Peter, like that's happened with lots of people that Peter has, has you know, led me to having this discussion with. They, they would never have entered into this transaction without firstly entering into that first transaction. Very much But so. I have to, can I add to that? I actually haven't done the Alpha course, so I'm very excited to be here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a free will and it's a personal choice and development. An advanced soul. Yeah, an advanced soul. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not implying you have to have done the alpha course to be here. What yeah, I'm saying, no, that's not what I mean. What that's I'm just saying just is that it opens did. you up yeah, yeah, enough. Yeah. And, and at some point you made that choice. Like all of you today made this choice to listen to this crazy man saying he's Jesus today. Right? You could have all just looked at the CD. Look, and a lot of people do. They, they watch the first part of the CD when I sit down and say who I am. And then they just turn it off and walk off in a huff. Right? And never want to have anything more to do with it. That's religious teachings have done that to us, haven't they? If someone's very controlled, 
it's often these it's often these old injuries. <coughs> that's exactly right. Yep. That the old injuries causes us to make that choice. Yep. How do you know when you make the right choice? Like, say if you're in a no-win situation and you're, and, you know, and, and you're trying to do the best, but things just don't work out right. Yep. Or for either person. Um, well, that brings us to um, your soul and the law of attraction. Because the question actually has a lot to do with the law of attraction. So perhaps what we need to do is just discuss a little bit about the law of attraction. Does that, that yeah. sound alright? Your soul, remember, is what? Emotions. Your emotions. That's your soul. <coughs> and of course, your soul has hundreds of attributes, all of the same type. They are all the things that define your personality. And your personality modifies as you absorb more and more different emotions and different feelings and develop different desires and different passions. That's what happens to your soul. So there's your soul. Your soul creates everything that happens to you. Everything. So if you're in a situation that seems to be a no-win situation, your soul created that. And it's a soul emotion that created that. And the soul emotion is an emotion of saying, I, no matter what I'm doing, I'm useless. No matter what, I'm do, what I do, I'm stuffed. Now, that's a hopeless emotion, isn't it? Can you see that? So it's actually a hopeless emotion that exists in the soul that that situation is triggering for you to work through. And the only way you're going to be able to work through it is by grieving about it. So when you grieve about the hopeless emotion that's in your soul, the hopeless emotion will leave you and then you will no longer be confronted with what seem to be hopeless situations. Yeah, but what if another person is involved and you're trying to do the best for that person? That's right. It makes no difference how many people are involved. You will find if you feel your emotion, everything around you will automatically change and adjust to suit the new soul condition inside of you. Now, yesterday, can I give a few examples of this first? Yesterday, I was talking to the group over at Dubbo, and I gave an example of when I was on a flight uh, coming back from London to Australia. I was on this flight, and I always make sure, because I'm vegan, I don't eat meat or, or, or dairy products or anything like that, and when, I always make sure that I tell an airline what um, I can eat so that on the flight I can have something to eat. So as per usual, all of the flights that I had overseas, I always do that. And on this flight coming back to Australia, everyone in the plane got fed and I didn't get a meal. So it all got, you know how it all gets distributed and it all gets distributed and all gets distributed. And then, like, I was the only one, everyone's around, everyone, even, <laughs> even my girl next to me, she's got her meal, you know. And she, she got her meal that I ordered for her <laughs> as well, which was also a vegan meal. Um, but I didn't get my vegan meal. And, and so I could have, at that moment, put up my hand and said, well, what's going on? Where's my meal? <laughs> Couldn't I? Yeah. Which is the average response most people would have done, isn't it? Okay. Did you say she was vegan as well? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you were left out. I was left out, yeah. <laughs> so what was my emotion creating this event? I'm overlooked and left out and nobody really cares about me. You follow me? Yeah. So what I did was I sat down and just allowed myself to get into that emotion. And my soulmate's next to me, she's saying things like, uh, you sure you don't want some of mine? Because <laughs> she was feeling a bit guilty. And I said, no, 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 I don't want any of yours because this is my creation. I need to own this. Then she was a bit angry with me for being a martyr. I said, no, 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 I'm not a martyr. I'm just, I am just, you know, trying to stay in this emotion. You watch what will happen if I can deal with this emotion. So what I did was I just, I just allowed myself to sit down, put my headphones on, and I started crying. So I cried for about 15 minutes on the plane. You get away with that. Lots of people cry on planes, you know, like, and they've just left their loved ones somewhere else. You get away. With it. And so, you know, slight concern from other passengers, but that's all. And so, so I cry the emotion, and I, and, I'm just, and I didn't connect to all of it, but after about 15 minutes, I had two attendants come up to me and say, oh, you didn't actually get a meal, did you? 
And I said, no. And they said, well, what do you like? And I said, well, I'm vegan, and uh, what I'd really like is a big bowl of something like pumpkin soup or something like that, and, and a big, big salad. You know, that's what I'd really like. I was being a bit facetious. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect to get that. But I said, I said look, anything that's not meat, I'll look at, you know. They said, oh, we'll see what we can do. And five minutes later, they come back from first class with a big bowl of soup and a big bowl of salad for me. <laughs> exactly what I wanted. So you just need to actually consciously put yourself into a, a mode that can bring up that emotion. That's all you need to do. You don't need to actually think about what the actual emotion might be, word to it, nothing. It's, it's okay, just feel it. Just feel it. Try and and when you there. feel it and experience it, everything around you will automatically change and adjust to your new soul condition. And you those um, techniques that you spoke about earlier that you're going to talk to us about, we could also use one of those techniques. Yes, in, but in making that divine connection. True. Yeah. Oh. But but if you're not willing to feel your emotions, <coughs> you will find that your life is so like you're getting going to be triggered every day with all of the emotions that are inside of you until you decide to experience them. So understand. Did, does everyone understand what I was saying there with yeah, what was going on? Yeah. The power of your soul is that all you need do is clear away the emotion that created the event, and you will automatically change future <coughs> events. That's all you need to do. You don't have to talk to anybody about it. In fact, if you talk to someone about it, usually you're avoiding the emotion. You don't need to talk about it. You don't need to rave on about it or anything. You just need to feel the emotion. Can you just clear up something for me? It's really confusing. Yep. Can you walk out of the emotion, feeling it, breathing over it was a word you used? Yep. With well, your attraction, are you attracting more? No, this is a false belief. Thank you. I okay? What's the and I, I really need to clarify that, so I'll ask that question again. The question is, if you're in the emotion, aren't you actually creating the event and attracting more of the event? And the answer is definitely no. The only time you attract more of something is when you refuse to feel the emotion. Right? It's when you refuse to feel the causal emotion, and I must state that it's the causal one that you need to feel. So in other words, I could have sat there on the plane crying about not getting fed. But is that the cause of emotion? No. And I could have cried there all day and nothing would have changed if I cried about not getting fed. Right? So that wasn't the cause of emotion. I had to get deeper into the cause of emotion and the cause of emotion is being overlooked, uncared for. Right? Those were the causal emotions that I allowed myself to get into. Once I felt that emotion, everything instantly changed. So the lady that was talking earlier about the deeper emotion in terms of with regard to this, with regard to being angry, is always that I'm avoiding this deep grief that I feel inside of myself. I don't want to experience the deep painful grief that I actually feel that I've tried my hardest in my life and nothing seemed to work. Do you follow me? And that emotion is the causal emotion. If I can connect to that causal emotion and cry about that for as long as it takes, it might take three days, four days a week or whatever, cry about that and release that, then what will happen is automatically the law of attraction will begin changing. It's the <coughs> grief inside of me that got passed down even to my children. And it's the grief inside of them that causes them to go and find substances to abuse to avoid their own grief. Do you follow me? So it's actually the grief inside of me that's created these events. And I need to find the cause. If I don't find the cause, the effect will continue occurring for the rest of my existence. And I don't mean just your earthly existence. I mean the rest of your existence, even in the spirit world, until you find the cause and release it inside of you, for the rest of your existence you will attract similar events. Excuse me, AJ. What if you can't cry anymore? What if you can't cry anymore? Be patient and you'll get asked yeah. an answer. <laughs> so, when you go into that space, do you have to cry? Can I just stop you for a sec? Yeah. What's the emotion you feel? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just trying to work that out. I'm just trying to ask you about that. Yeah. Like that. Uh, isn't it being it's overlooked? It's obvious you have to work it out. <laughs> <laughs> what was the emotion? I just was so... <sighs> you went... <sighs> Her arm was hurting. What was the emotion? <laughs> 
Because all of these things are good at what to do. What I wanted to ask you about was what, what if you're doing the anchor thing and you don't re really know what's underneath that, can you just, if you don't know what the emotion is, how do you get to where then you can find out what that emotion is? You're doing the anger thing because you already know what's underneath and you don't want it. Yeah, but what I mean is that... <laughs> that's just an But if you're in a situation where you really don't know what the emotion is that's going on underneath, whatever's happening. Like no, but we always know what the emotion is underneath. Hey, um, what I'm saying is. That's because we're consciously trying to do it and we shouldn't be consciously exactly, trying to do it. Exactly. As soon as you want rules and, and consciousness, as soon as you try to use this, you are going to find you're going to struggle every single time. Because, because this isn't capable of understanding emotion. Right? Understand that as soon as you're in a state of annoyance, anger, frustration, and any of those emotions, you have already chosen to deny what's underneath. You've already chosen it. It's not that you don't know what's there, it's that it's, something is there and you don't want it. Do you have to be able to name the emotion? No. To deal with it? No. That's not good. No. Not at all. In fact, if you need to name an emotion before you feel it, you're going to really struggle on the divine path. Yeah. And that will be the reason why you need to name the emotion is why. There's an emotion driving that even. What's the emotion driving your Control. need to know what it is? <laughs> Control. You want to make sure that you know what the emotion is before you experience it. Why would you want to do that? Because you're actually so afraid of experiencing it that you want to have some kind of intellectual <coughs> control over this whole process. That's why you're doing that. Right? And that's okay, you can choose to do that. Now, getting back to your question, this gets back down to the issue of suppression. This is what happens to us generally. We have a painful emotion, so let's just write down pain. Then what we want to do is we don't want to feel our pain, so we suppress our pain. So what happens then is we have a tendency to get, so we stop crying there, because we're sick and tired of doing that, and we get into this state, or annoyance, or frustration. And then, particularly if I'm a woman, I'm not allowed to do that either, right? That's not very feminine, is it? To get angry all the time, right? Get criticised for that. And what happens when you're around men, when you're angry? Well, of course, most men are angry too, right? So what do they do? They just yell and scream back, you know? So we start doing this with that, as well. And what happens then? We start getting into this state. Now we're starting to shut down all emotion. We're trying to keep ourselves away from all emotion. And you can, when you shut down your underlying emotion, you will create another state. And the top state is that a spell numb? Yeah. <laughs> is that you just become totally numb to your entire existence. Now, if you've, done, if you've done that, what's happened is you've probably firstly gone through these states in your life, not coped with them and not dealt with the underlying emotion, and then put <coughs> another cap on top of each one. Right? Now, we can undo all of that. You can undo all of that. You don't have to stay in these states. But it requires some bravery and some courage. And the way we get bravery and courage is the same way we get most other things I find, and that is via my connection with God. That's how I get it. Because right? in myself, I'm not very brave and I'm not very courageous. But it's my connection with God and my connection with truth that makes me brave or courageous. And the same will apply with yourself. How much of a love of truth do you have inside of your heart? That's what's going to actually open this back up. So what we want to do is get back down... Get back down, get back down, and then we start feeling <coughs> this underlying thing that we don't even know probably is there at the moment. And that underlying thing might be this really big feeling that I should never have been born, or an underlying feeling that I'm just totally unworthy to even exist, or any of those kinds of emotions. That's probably what's created all of that in the beginning. And all I need to do is experience that, just like a child, without judgment, 
The child doesn't judge itself when it goes kicking and screaming on the floor, does it? No? No? We won't turn this. That's not a thing. No? <laughs> he doesn't care how embarrassed you are. Does it? No. So, so why do you care when you're feeling an emotion of that judgment? Why do you want to do that? It's because of all the judgments that have been placed on you. It's because of all of this conditioning <coughs> that you've had through your life, right? So when you get into that childhood anger, you'll feel like just kicking and screaming on the floor and cracking a tantrum. And the kids will say, oh, I'm so glad she's now cacking a tantrum just on the floor instead of smacking me behind the ears, right? <laughs> or I'm so glad she's cracking a tantrum on the floor and if it's your husband instead of yelling and screaming at me, right? The truth is, when you fully own and experience your own emotion, what happens is everyone around you doesn't have to experience it. The instant you choose to not experience your own emotion, it affects every single living thing and every single inanimate object around you. Right. And I'm not just saying right in here in Bathurst, I'm saying in the universe. Your energy that you're holding on to inside of yourself affects the entire universe. How many times do you cry that? And well, it depends on, on what I'm processing. And in the last, in the last uh, about three months, and I was dealing with some really intense soulmate loss emotions, and I cried for five hours a day for, uh, for nine weeks. <coughs> <laughs> now, I dealt, with, I dealt with lots and lots of emotions in that time, and the biggest emotion, the last, when I got to the last deep core emotion, it was all about this feeling about I, that I've got no idea how to love myself, and no idea how anybody's going to teach me. <laughs> right? And when I felt that, the irony is the moment after that, I felt totally blissful and happy. Under the blessing. One of the ladies cried nearly all the time yep. through the process. Yep. So she was dealing with that emotion. Yeah, whenever, often we receive divine love, and divine love in itself, the reception of divine love, causes us to actually expose the emotion and be open emotionally. And so any emotions that are in error inside of us begin to just be expressed. So it's fine to do that. The, the issue is if you're crying all the time about the same thing, then you are not finding the cause, and that's not very productive. So, so let's say I'm a person who's crying all the time because I'm alone and I haven't got a partner. I'm not dealing with the underlying causal emotion in that case. The underlying causal emotion is that I've created not having a partner because of an emotion inside of me that says, I don't want anybody close to me. And I'm not letting myself feel that. I'm just thinking that I do want somebody close to me, someone to love me. But inside of myself, I'm feeling oh, I'm unlovable. And I don't want to feel that emotion. But my law of attraction has shown me already that I've created that. So right now, if I'm not with a partner, and I want to be with one, the truth is that want to be is only here. It's not here. Because if it was here, you would already be with one. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. yeah. So oftentimes what we do is we tell ourselves certain messages in here, but in here we have totally <coughs> the opposite emotion. And a lot of times our addictions are a good indicator <coughs> of what we're avoiding inside of ourselves. So I'm going along to the club, I want to meet some more women, I'll go along to another club and meet some more women or whatever, and I'm trying to meet different women because I want to find the woman that I want to spend the rest of the life with, but I'm actually alone. What am I, all, of, all of that is just a waste of my time. What I need to do is firstly tune into the emotion that I feel inside of myself that causes me to repel women. And as soon as I do that, ironically, there will be a lineup of women who want to be with me. And I'll be able to choose the one that uh, I feel is most suitable. Does everyone understand that? Yeah. yeah. And that applies to all sorts of issues. You think about it, even in, even in any relationship issues, quite often what happens is we'll have, um, you'll be on the opposite side of the room, let's say I'm single, and I'm a, I'm a single male, and opposite side of the room I see a lovely lady that I want to get to know. So I start walking towards her, right? So the first, the first 
motive to walk towards her is one of desire, isn't it? Desire to get to know her. And that's pure, isn't it, generally? So, although it might be driven by sexual desire, perhaps it might not be so pure. But generally it's pure. I want to get to know this person. So you take a walk towards her, but then what kicks in? Fear of rejection. Yeah. Like if, I've got a, if I've got a feeling that I might get rejected, that's going to kick in now. Now is my desire pure anymore? No. No, because now it's being affected by a fear. And so I'm going to, oh, oh, do I want to do this, you know? And, and a lot of times we won't even get to making the steps towards that woman, would we? We would actually stop in being so much fear that we won't actually make the decision to get to know <coughs> her at all. So, oftentimes we start out with a pure desire, but it triggers all of these underlying emotions that are in us that we've all kept under wraps and all of a sudden are there and what do we do then? We make a choice based on the emotions that are in error rather than continuing to make a choice that are based on pure emotions. So, how am I going to deal with that? I would need to deal with the fact of potential rejection. So what I need to do is go back through my life and feel the things that I haven't felt where I have been rejected. The things that I shut down where I 